Today I'm going to do a quick comparison between the Korg Minilog XD and the Electron Analog 4. Both of these are four voice analog subtractive synthesizers. They have sort of at a high level a similar sound synthesis pipeline. However, there are some very important differences between these two devices. So to start with, the Korg is a significantly cheaper and somewhat lower end device. The Korg runs for about $650 and the Analog 4 runs closer to $1,500. So it's about two and a half times more expensive. Another obvious difference is that the Korg has a physical built-in keyboard, whereas the Analog 4 has no built-in keyboard at all. The idea here is basically that Electron has decided that they are not a keyboard company, they are a synthesizer company. They don't have a lot of expertise in making nice keyboards, so they figure that basically anyone who's going to buy one of their synths and wants to play expressively with the keyboard can just use an external MIDI keyboard. Korg, on the other hand, wants to provide sort of a more all-in-one device uh, where it's easier to get into even if you don't have other studio equipment like a keyboard. So they've sort of, you know, packaged this all together. And it's, it's not a great keyboard or anything. It's a pretty basic keyboard. It's got velocity sensing, but the keys are small and it's got no aftertouch. So, you know, it's, it's sort of a good starter keyboard, but uh, not necessarily something that you'd want to use uh, for, you know, th the most expressive synthesis possible. Uh, second major difference is that this guy is made in China and this guy is made in Sweden which goes a long way to explaining some of that cost difference. The build quality in general on the Minilog is lower than on the Electron device. The Electron device, the entire exterior is made out of some sort of rolled sheet metal. The Korg is a mixture of plastic and aluminum. The, the build quality on, on the Korg is, is pretty good. Um, it's, it's definitely reasonable for this price range, but the Electron is uh, for sure better. Now, a very important difference as far as actually playing music on these synthesizers is that the mini log has, like I said, they both have four voices, but all of the voices on the mini log are locked to the same parameters. So in other words, you can play up to four sounds at once, but they all have to be the exact same instrument. So whenever you turn a knob, it affects all four voices the same way. On the other hand, the analog four each of the four voices can be programmed independently. So you can actually play four different sounds at once, or you can play four of the same sound. It's, it's sort of configurable up to you. You have four tracks, and each track can have a totally different set of parameters. And at any given time, a track can use any of the available hardware voices. So if you want, you could play, you know, over here. We can play three sounds at once, but they're just the same pitches, or they're just different pitches of the same sound. Over here on the Analog 4, we can actually play four different sounds at once, uh, not just multiple pitches of the same sound. Or we can play multiple pitches of the same sound if we configure it that way. So that's uh, this is quite a bit more flexible. You can you can write an entire song with you know pads and percussions and a lead and all kinds of stuff uh, just on this one device, and you can play all those sounds at the same time. The Analog 4 also has a number of features that the Minilog doesn't really try to have at all. Uh, for example, the Analog 4 has audio inputs, uh, which you can use either just as pass-throughs, or you can actually use those audio inputs as modulation sources. The Korg has no audio inputs, it only has audio outputs. Additionally, the Analog 4 has uh, CV inputs and outputs, so you can integrate this with Eurorack or whatever. The Korg has no CV in or out, and the Minilog also has the capacity to uh, control and sequence things over CV, uh, which the, the Korg doesn't really try to do. Um, so you have a few extra capabilities here that, that just don't exist on the Korg at all. Now, moving on to the actual synthesis hardware, the Korg has a pretty basic analog synthesis pipeline. It's, it's kind of a standard thing you'll see on any analog synth. You start with a number of waveform generators. So these waveform generators can output different types of waves. You can have a triangle wave, a sawtooth wave, a square wave. So let's change this to a square wave. 
And you can see one nice thing the Korg has that the Electron doesn't is this little oscilloscope display. If we change this to a triangle wave, you can see the difference. You can generate multiple waves. So let's make a, let's make a sawtooth wave and we'll put it one octave below the first wave. And we'll go ahead and turn up that amplitude. And we can add two things together that way. And the Korg also has this interesting multi-engine, which is basically uh, a capacity to run a user-defined program to generate a digital signal, which is then converted to analog and mixed in. So one of the most useful things, in, as far as I'm concerned on this, is the noise generator. So you can, uh, let's turn that up. You can add some noise into your, into your signal. Uh, but they provide a GitHub repository, which you can download and you can build your own custom patches. I did a couple of these. They were a little annoying to do. I don't think most users are gonna be making their own custom patches. Maybe you can find some online that you can download. Uh, but for the most part, I think this is really just useful as a noise generator, unless you wanna get really into it and make uh, some, some custom digital synthesis uh, stuff that you can, you can upload onto this device. So you've got these three oscillators, and then you've got a mixer, which combines them together. If we go over to the analog four, we've got a pretty similar setup. So uh, we've got oscillator one, and we've got oscillator two, and both of these have selectable waveforms, so we can change this too. We have a few more waveforms on the analog four. We have a uh, sawtooth wave. We've also got this sort of trapezoid wave, which is like an analog distorted square wave a normal square wave, triangle wave, and we can actually use the audio inputs as modulation sources, which is quite interesting. So we can uh, generate audio on an external device and then pass it in as a waveform. So that's quite cool. Uh, there's also this feedback pathway. You can look at the PDF manual to uh, see how this is set up internally, but basically there's just sort of a, a loop back in the analog synthesis hardware, or you can just turn it off uh, if we go to the second oscillator, we have similar options. Uh, we can you know, do all those standard waves, left in, right in, and we can actually take in audio from the previous voice. So we can actually chain multiple voices together, which allows us to do some interesting stuff and some more complex synthesis pipelines that wouldn't be possible on the cork. Um, if we go, let's go ahead and just kind of do a similar thing here. So we'll change this to a trapezoid wave, and then we'll go to oscillator two, and we'll put that as a triangle wave, turn it up, and we will, let's turn that one octave down. Okay, uh, we've also got a number of parameters here that we don't have on the Korg. We've got um, some, some fine tune parameters so, so we can do some more precise tuning. Uh, we've got detune, we've got, um, some built-in pulse width modulation stuff. So if we go ahead and we can do some cool pulse width effects like that. Um, if we go to oscillator two, so each oscillator has two settings, uh, two pages of settings. So uh, I mentioned the multi-engine on the Korg, which allows you to do custom digital patches the analog four does not have anything like that, but it does have the audio input, so you can do stuff that way. And it does have a built-in noise generator. So we can go ahead and turn up the noise gen. And that's, like I said, one of the most useful things for the multi-engine, so you can do that here. You can change the color of the noise and uh, you can change some shaping and, and all kinds of stuff. You can also fade the noise in and out. So if you want to, um, have the noise build up. You can do that, which is kind of nice. You, one thing you'll notice on the Analog 4 is that it's got a lot of these little sort of envelope generators or faders or, or pulsers or whatever sort of scattered all over the place. Uh, so for common tasks where you might want to fade something in or out, you can do it without taking up uh, an envelope generator, which we'll talk about later. Um, you've got on both devices, you've got some options for uh, ring modulating and, and syncing between the two oscillators. So sync resets and the, on the Korg it just resets the second oscillator when the first one hits a zero. Turn that off. 
uh, and the ring modulator multiplies the two oscillators together. On the analog four, we've got some similar options on the second page of oscillator two, but we have some more control. So we can pick, um, we can actually multiply the output of the first oscillator by the output of the second oscillator, and we can do the other way. So, so we can actually, we have sort of bi-directional ability to multiply these things together. Uh, we also have some extra sync parameters like we can, um, we can choose which way it syncs. So we can have the first oscillator sync the second one. We can have the second oscillator reset the first oscillator, or we have this metal option, which I'm guessing is some sort of bi-directional thing. We can also change the sync amount. We've got built-in bend, so we can sort of bend the pitch as we come in. Uh, so obviously we've got a few more parameters here. This is this is a bit more powerful than what we've got on the mini log. We've got some some more flexibility in this initial oscillator setup. We've also got a built-in uh, vibrato, uh, which we can again we basically just have this little LFO here that we can use without taking up a normal LFO. Let's turn that off. Cool. So basically. Analog 4 has, uh, for the most part, more capability. The one advantage the Korg has is it's got this multi-engine, but, uh, you know, sort of up in the air how useful that is in practice. Moving on to the filters. So on the mini log, we've got this low-pass filter. So let's go ahead and turn that down. And this just smooths out the signal. So if we turn that way up, we've got all these rough edges in our signal. And if we turn it down, it smooths out those rough edges. Uh, we can change the resonance of the filter, which basically just boosts frequencies near the cutoff. We can also change the drive, which is basically like a, a waveform distortion thing. So it, it adds some sort of, once you get into higher amplitudes, it sort of adds a little bit of clipping, which can add some nice harmonics. Uh, and then we've got key tracking, which just says, should the cutoff frequency of the filter go up as you go to higher keys? So if we turn this off and we open up the filter just enough to allow this guy through, it's not going to allow this guy through. If we turn the key track on, it'll allow them through to the same degree. So if you want sort of more volume consistency across the whole range, you want to use key tracking. On the analog four, we've got a low pass filter. So let's go ahead and turn that down. And this is a ladder filter in hardware. So it's it's uh, it has sort of a classic analog low pass filter sound. That chops off those high frequencies. We've also got a drive setting, although uh, we've got We've got resonance, we've got uh, this drive, which is more flexible than the drive on the mini log. We have two overdrive modes. We can go that way, or we can go negative, which uses a different overdrive algorithm. Uh, we've also got a key tracking parameter, except instead of being 0, 50, or 100, we actually have a whole range of values. Uh, you can actually go greater than 100% key tracking, so it really opens up on high frequencies. Or you can go negative key tracking where it actually closes down more when you play higher notes, which is kind of an interesting thing. You've got these two depth controls, which I'll get to in a minute. One really nice thing on the analog four is we've actually got a second filter, and this is a general purpose filter. You can use this for uh, low pass or high pass or band pass or notch or whatever. It's not just a low pass filter. So let's go ahead and just cut off the low end. All right. And uh, you can change that to other types of filters. Um, let's just leave it as a high pass. And then same deal, you've got key tracking and you've got this depth param, which I will talk about in a bit. So uh, next is the amplitude envelope generator. So basically this allows you to change the volume of the signal as time goes on. So I'm gonna go ahead and turn the attack up and this will make the volume come on slowly. Turn it way up just to exaggerate. So the longer your attack, the longer the sound waits to start up. The decay is 
after it initially ramps up, it can kind of settle down a little bit. So the decay just determines how long that takes. And the sustain is the amount it settles down to. So this will go up and then come back down and then kind of settle. Let's go ahead and turn that decay way down. And we'll turn the sustain back up. And then the release is after you let go of the key, how long does it take for the sound to fade? So we'll just turn that back down. Okay, on the analog four, we've got a pretty similar setup. We've got attack, decay, sustain, release. Uh, we've also got this additional parameter, which is the shape parameter, which allows us to determine whether the ramping is linear or if it's exponential, and also if it resets every time we play a note, or if it just continues from where it left off uh, from the last key that was pressed. So if we increase this, let's turn our attack up. So that's a linear ramp. If we turn it to an exponential ramp, it kind of starts slowly and then comes on fast. So let's turn that down. So I'll actually just, we've, we've got a bunch of different options for, for uh, the, the way that this turns on. Okay, uh, we've also got some, uh, we've got a chorus delay and reverb parameter down here, which I'll talk about later because it's that's sort of located in a different place on the analog four. Okay, uh, besides the amplitude envelope generator, we've also got a general purpose envelope generator. So uh, on the mini log, this is a very simple envelope generator. It only has two parameters, attack and decay. And we only have three places that we can send it. So for example, um, let's send it to the cutoff. So this is going to the filter. So right now, let's turn this to zero. So it's not doing anything. And turn this cutoff down. So we're cutting off a lot of high frequencies. I'm gonna go ahead and turn, let's turn the attack to something in the middle and the decay to something in the middle and then we'll turn the intensity up. So what this is gonna do is it's actually gonna send a positive value to the cutoff. So it's gonna temporarily boost the cutoff frequency and then it's gonna fall back down. So you hear it at the beginning, it, it ramps up, the cutoff value goes up and then it comes back down. If we turn the decay longer, it'll take longer to come back down. Okay, on the analog four, we have two envelope generators. So the first envelope generator is always routed to the filters. So um, the degree to which it affects the filters, the cutoff frequency of the filters, is based on this depth parameter. So let's go ahead and I'll turn this down. So it's pretty low pass, it's pretty cut off. And then um, I'll go ahead and make that kind of ramp up gradually. And then if we go back to the filter, we can increase the dependence on that and you can hear that it's ramping up with this envelope. Let's turn the uh, sustain way down so it sounds similar to the mini log. Now, one thing to notice is that whereas the mini log only has a very simple attack decay envelope, the analog four has a full attack decay sustain release envelope and we have the shape parameter and we have the ability to send the envelope to any two parameters in the system. So we can send, we can take this envelope and we can send it to all kinds of stuff. We can send it to like key tracking, pulse width, amp volume, whatever we want. Um, and we can send it to two different destinations besides the filters. And uh, there's this cutoff. So we can, uh, there's like a, a gate. So we can make this shut off after a fixed amount of time. Let's turn that off. Okay. Uh, and we've got two envelope generators. So we've only got one very basic envelope generator on the mini log, and we've got two full featured envelope generators on the Korg, or excuse me, on the Electron. So uh, the second envelope generator, once again, we can send it to any two synthesis parameters in the entire system. So we have tons of options. We can, we can affect anything we want. On the Korg, it's only these three parameters. Okay, uh, and for the exact list of things that you can send these to, you can check out the, the manual. It's, it's 
basically you know they have to they have to sort of build it in and there maybe are certain hardware parameters where they don't have a wire or something but almost anything you want you can you can control with these envelope generators now moving on to the LFO on the uh, Korg we've got one sort of basic LFO uh, the LFO just like the envelope generator lets you control some of these parameters so I'm gonna go ahead and let's control the pitch and I'll set this intensity to zero ish so it's not doing anything right now uh, we'll set this to a normal oscillator and we'll turn the intensity up and you can see that's sort of wiggling the pitch and we can change it to a square wave and that'll toggle between two pitches and then we've got three sync modes we've got BPM where the frequency of the LFO is synced to the BPM. So if you turn the BPM up, the LFO will go faster. Normal is unsynced, and one shot will only go through one waveform, and then it'll turn off. On And then, once again, we have just three targets. So we can send it to the pitch, the shape parameter of the oscillator, or the cutoff frequency of the filter. On the analog four, we've got two oscillators, and each oscillator can be sent to any two synthesis parameters. And we've got a lot more parameters on the oscillator. So let's go ahead, this is already sent to, let's send it to the oscillator one pitch. So we've also got a, a bunch of different sort of more precise things that we can do with the oscillators here. We can either send it to pitch, which is exponential pitch changes or frequency, which is linear. Let's go ahead and send it to pitch. Uh, and then I'll go ahead and turn up the strength. And we'll make it a square wave. And we'll turn up the speed. Hold on, oh, oops, I accidentally turned that off. Uh, pitch mod, yes. Maybe that's too fast. There we go. Okay, um, so let's make that a little bit faster. Uh, we can sync these frequencies to either the BPM or we can make it unsynced. This is just probably synced to like 120 BPM or something. Or we can actually sync these frequencies to the frequency of the key we're pressing, which allows us to actually do FM synthesis, which is pretty cool because we have these audio rate locked things. So let's put this to like 2000 uh, times the audio frequency. That one doesn't sound very good, <laughs> but you get the idea. Uh, so instead of just being BPM synced or unsynced, we have also the option to be audio rate synced uh, and we've got a few other parameters. Like we've got, we've got some more options for the waveform. We have a random waveform. We've got uh, free, which means that the oscillator is just constantly running in the background. We've got trig, which means that it resets on every time you press a key. We've got a hold mode, which means that when you press a key, it'll just pause the oscillator. So you can add some random stuff that changes every key that way. Uh, we've got one shot, which is the same as over here. It just runs through one cycle of the waveform. We've got a half shot, which just goes through a half cycle. Um, so yeah, this is obviously quite a bit more powerful than the LFO over here. And again, we've got two of them. And each LFO can go to two different sources with different amplitudes. So you can control a total of four things with different amplitudes and, and two different waveforms. So quite a bit more flexibility with the LFOs over here. We've got some effects on both of these. I'm gonna turn this LFO off. Uh, let's go to this, let's turn that down. Okay. If I had two hands, I could set that to zero easily. Okay. Um, so we've got some effects over here. The effects are controlled right here. So let's go ahead and go to our delay and we will turn that on. And you can hear that delay effect. Uh, we can have a reverb, so let's turn that on. And sure, smooth sounds good. And you can hear that kind of 
echoey room effect. And then we've got a modifier, which is basically just like a chorus or a flanger or something. Okay, and uh, on the analog four, we've also got these effects. Worth noting that the effects on the analog four are shared across all of the audio. So you don't have a separate effects system per voice. Uh, all four voices feed into the same effects chain. So uh, let's go ahead and if we go here, we can go back to the amp page and we can turn up chorus, for example. Turn up delay. You can hear that repeat in the background and turn up reverb. And then we go to the effects track and we can control the parameters of these. So for example, I can turn up the delay time or turn it down. Okay, uh, so basically we've just got kind of similar things. We've got the, the, the three fundamental effects are the same, but we've got quite a bit more control over effect parameters on the analog four. On both devices, we just have one global effect system that affects all the sounds. We don't have different effects per track. Let's see, um, I guess the main thing that remains to talk about is the sequencer. So on the mini log, we do technically have a sequencer, but it's basically like a toy. Like the only thing they really use it for is if we go to a, a preset, you can push play. And they've built in a little, a little song that you can play on the preset. Um, but it's only 16 steps and it's really annoying to use. So it, it's not really a practical sequencer for, for anything. Like you're not gonna write music on this sequencer. It's, it's really just for in-store demos. Also, one very annoying thing that I wanna point out is that uh, you'll notice I went to a preset and then back. It does not save any changes you make unless you explicitly choose to save them. And then it's kind of annoying because it, it doesn't really like, it doesn't tell you if you're overwriting something. You just have to pick a random slot to save it in and you don't know what's there. So it, it's, this device isn't really usable on its own. If you want to do complex stuff, like, you know, make your own patches and stuff, you, you'd need a DAW or something to manage this. Uh, if you, and that can be kind of annoying because then you're dealing with, uh, you know, like MIDI dumps of, like SysX dumps of all the parameters and stuff. So um, you, can't, you can't really use this device as its own sort of groove box music workstation. You really have to use this as, as part of something else. On the other hand, the Electron, if you've never heard of it, one of the most popular things that Electron devices have is what they call the Electron Sequencer. So Electron devices have this really, really powerful sequencer where you can uh, record songs basically on the device and you can compose things and you can make very complex and powerful compositions with lots of randomness and you can adjust parameters and stuff. Uh, I'm not going to talk about that too much in this video because I'm sure there are hundreds of YouTube videos about the Electron Sequencer, but it's really, really good and you can actually write like real music in the Electron Sequencer and it's very fun and pleasant to use. So it, effectively you can round that to the Korg doesn't have a sequencer at all and the Electron has a world-class sequencer built in. Uh, and all of the Electron devices have a pretty similar sequencer system where you can you can write patterns and stuff. And I'll, I'll just, just real quick, I'll show a little demo of that. So let's go to track one. Um, and if I press play, nothing will happen because I don't have any, I don't have anything recorded. Uh, let's go ahead and I'll just press some things. Right, okay, so you can you can put things at these steps. You can have up to 64 steps in a pattern. You can chain multiple patterns together. And you can, of course, chain. So let's say these guys are gonna be, uh, let's set that to C. Okay, so those are C. And then we'll set this one to E. And that's just like the tip of the iceberg. There are a million things you can do. You can, uh, if you wanna go to like the oscillator parameters, oh, <laughs> One thing I totally forgot to mention, uh, on the um, the Electron device, the oscillators ha each oscillator has a sub-oscillator, which is a second oscillator, which is, it's sort of a simple oscillator that's tied to the frequency of the first one, but it allows you to add some more uh, harmonics to your sound. So for just this note, let's go ahead and we'll enable 
the sub oscillator at two octaves below. And you can hear that sort of growl underneath. If I turn that to fifth, you would get a nice sort of rich, perfect fifth there. So I totally forgot about that. But anyway, you can, any synthesis parameter, you can customize on a step-by-step -step basis, which is very, very powerful and allows you to write very cool songs. You can even change the, the, the sound of the track at every step. You can load a different sound just on a single step. So all of this is to say that there are some big similarities between these two devices, right? They're, they both have sort of a, a conceptually similar analog synthesis pathway. You've got waveform generators, mixers, filters, envelope generators, LFOs, and so on. But on the Analog 4, you've got a lot more of all of these things, and everything is more powerful, right? You have more synthesis parameters, you have uh, more oscillators, more envelope generators, more places you can send those oscillators and envelope generators. And uh, the, the sequencers aren't even really comparable. You can use an Electron device to write and compose entire songs just on the device. On the Korg, you, you can't really do that. It's, you're basically using it like a piano, where everything is just from memory. You can't really you know, create songs on it, except insofar as you're using it as an instrument. So while the, the core analog synthesis hardware is, is kind of conceptually similar, the way you use it is very different and the number of things that you can practically do on the Electron device is vastly higher. It, it has a lot more roles that it can fill than the Korg can realistically fill. So hopefully that explains some of the differences and uh, why this device is a couple times more expensive. In my mind, uh, this is, is really money well spent. It's actually if anything, the Korg, in my opinion, is a little bit overpriced for what you get. Like I said, I think this is like 600 bucks or 650 bucks or something like that. Um, and uh, the the Analog 4 is, is only a few times that and uh, really brings a lot more to the table. I mean, if you can, if you want to make songs just on this device, you can do it. You might start to feel a little bit limited by just having four voices once you add like drums and stuff. But uh, if you're judicious, you can definitely get away with it. So uh, yeah, feel free to leave any questions in the comments, but hopefully that comparison was uh, helpful and gives you some idea of which of these two devices is going to better fit your use for it.